This week, Chad Beckman joins us from Secure Digital Solutions for our feature interview. Michael's got some startup news, surprising facts about successful startup founders, why Johnson & Johnson's getting into startups, why Pepsi held an internal marketing shark tank contest for a million dollars in funding. We're going to talk about some companies of interest, including Wallarm and Delv Labs. And we'll give you an update on our journeys. All that and more on Startup Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. I need it from the top. Brought to you by Logarithms Netmon Freemium delivers real-time network visibility to quickly identify emerging threats in your IT environment. Netmon Freemium is a free commercial-grade network forensics and traffic analytics solution. You can use Netmon Freemium's powerful capabilities to search against all of observed network traffic, identify abnormal traffic patterns and application usage, and quickly analyze full packet captures. Take the first step towards real-time network visibility. Visit logarithm.com forward slash freemium to learn more and download it today. Welcome, everyone, to Startup Security Weekly. We're going to be filled with holiday cheer because this is our last episode before the holidays. So I have my, I'm donning my, my gay apparel. I've got the Christmas tree in the background. I don't know if you can see it very well, but the production staff decorated the Christmas tree. There is a red Ethernet cable and a green Ethernet key, cable <laughs> around our Christmas tree. It is very fitting. So proud. It's wonderful to be here. We're broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, where it's very, very cold. Very holiday-like cold out there today. Uh, probably where it's not as cold, Mr. Michael Santarcangelo is here with us today. I, I gotta say, Paul, uh, I think it went into that. When I woke up this morning, they said it feels like 23. So it's cold. You know, I feel bad. I should have strung up some holiday lights behind me. You know, I, I gotta... I got some goals for 2017. I, I got to get like a psychedelic background and, uh, and, you know, if I could have your, your char- charming looks, I'd, you know, maybe it'd be easier for me. Well, but. I mean, we could just give all of our listeners LSD and then both those things would be true <laughs> yeah. and we'd be all set. <laughs> those guys go so they say some really deep stuff. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and why do you always have pink elephants on the show? That's I don't right. understand. I love their set design. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so I, we found a new startup business, I think. I think we did. This is going to be great. And um, the last show of the year. It is the is... last show. Well, because next Friday is our Christmas party, and it's December 23rd. Not much going on that day. So, uh, you know, and we've had a, a strong year. We're on episode 20. Yeah, it's um, a good way to end. Which is great that we pulled off 20 episodes. I mean, I shoot for, but somewhere between 40 and 50 episodes in a year. So the fact that we were about halfway there, and I don't think, did we start half, when did we start? We didn't start. Yeah, we started after the halfway point. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm. I'm excited, Paul. So we've been we've been rocking it. Um, we've got some new sponsors uh, that we'll announce. Uh, there's a, actually um, th- this show because it's the newest show has uh, actually three spots open still. For sponsor, so if you know someone that wants to sponsor uh, or be interested in sponsoring, please let us know. Uh, as this is our newest show, we're we're hitting the ground running though. It, this is so much fun. I th- I love all of our shows, uh, and it's just been great to do this with Michael. And we're going to continue obviously in 2017. Uh, hopefully, Michael will make it out here at some point. Well, February 9th, we're talking about having a big Security Weekly shindig here. <sighs> And that sounds great, but you just got done telling me how cold it was. And I've got done well, explaining to everybody might, I moved to where it, it might cold. not be that <laughs> so cold in February. Your, your sales I'll, job there. We I'll can, let you borrow our pitch deck. Or, I'll let you borrow my scarf it. or something. But uh, but no, we'll figure it out. You know, and what I want to point out too, and we've been teasing this a little bit, but we've got good plans. I mean, I've I've loved the interviews that we've had and the insights, and there's a number of them that I've actually had to go back and watch and take notes from. 
uh, that they've, they've been that good. But now we're also, we've, we've got uh, some investors that'll be joining us. We're looking at some, perhaps some recurring guests. We're getting a lot of really good feedback that's helping us figure out some segments and things that we can put together. And we've even started to talk about looking at the rest of that triangle of, of what it's like as the buyers. And I think the last interview where we talked about what it's like to get traction and, and what it's like from being on that internal side. So stick with because as we're growing and we're having more of these conversations, these are the things that we're going to keep bringing into the program, really looking at what it's like to be a startup and, and how you have to think about security because it's not optional anymore, but also what it's like to be in security and either adopt that startup mindset in your enterprise, which, and, and look, those stories, Paul, I don't know if you've seen in the last two or three weeks, they are on the rise. So you know we're going to talk about that next mm-hmm. year. We get to do so much exciting stuff here. And uh, no, I, I'm looking, I, it'll be nice to take a break, but I, I'm looking forward to hopping right back into it. Michael, why don't you introduce our special guest for today? Yeah, so I met Chad. Chad reached out to me um, a couple of months ago, and we've had a couple of great conversations. And so Chad Beckman runs a consulting company, and we're going to ask him how what that was like to get that started because I know a lot of people listening to us uh, deal with that. But what they look at is they look at business risk. And, and so he's got a platform, and they've built a product that works alongside, and we'll, we'll get all this figured out from him. But so when we look at startups and we look at business, what's cool about Chad is he's at that intersection of, well, I'm trying to help businesses secure themselves, and we're running a startup. And so we're running a startup in security, so we got to protect ourselves, and we got to help our clients better understand their risks so they can protect them. It's a, it's a good fit. So with that, uh, Chad, welcome. To well, thank you security. for having me. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, so no pressure, but you got to be good because it's the last one of the year. <clears throat> all right, I'll do my best. That does. Yeah, so no pressure. All right, well, so <laughs> tell us first a little bit about what the company does. And, and since I've already said that, so the consulting is product, tell us if, if they're the same, <clears throat> they're separate. Give us kind of that quick overview, and then we'll go unpack how yep. it all got started. All right, perfect. So um, the consulting company and the the software company is all one organization. And I struggled for a while to understand if we should be splitting it up. And actually, there's a lot more value in having uh, both together because we're able to solve problems holistically with our clients. And we'll get into what we actually do, how we solve those problems. Uh, but the services really do complement the software offering, the solution, and uh, vice versa. And so um, what we uh, end up doing is really coming in and understanding the business problem that security needs to solve. We've had a lot of conversation in the industry about getting away from purely IT-centric security. And uh, I feel like what we're doing is is somewhat on the leading edge of uh, driving some of that change as some of the leaders begin to think more holistically and have a better business conversation around uh, protecting the organization, investing back into the brand, uh, and showing some value back <clears throat> based on the investments that the organization's made. Um, so we can talk uh, in more detail as you'd like. Uh, well, how Chad, you yeah, so how did you uh, come to the decision to <laughs> incorporate both the product and the consulting in, in one company? Because I'm curious how you came to that conclusion because in a in my startup, we decided to go the opposite way. We really wanted separation between the product company and the services company. Great question. And it was something I struggled with for a while. I brought it to a few executive peer groups I've been part of. And uh, it's a mixed it's a mixed bag. Some people said, yeah, you should really break it out, uh, get a bunch of investment and get the software company going on its own. And others said, well, actually having a services arm that is complementary of the software is actually really valuable as an organization as a whole. So keep that intact. And so currently uh, what we've done is we've developed a consulting company started in 2005 and has been able to really fund the development and the maturation of our product suite um, from over the last two years. We started the development of the product in 2014. How we got started is actually through a services engagement. We were managing the security program for a client. The CIO came to us and said, show me the state of our security program. Where are we today? And where are we going to go? And what is it going to take to get there, most importantly? And the CIO, you know, this is in 2009, by the way. The CIO was not very astute with security, um, uh, not very technical. So we had to come up with a way to very easily explain it to him. But even more importantly, allow him to talk intelligently to the board of directors and the audit committee uh, where he was taking that message forward. And uh, we had a half hour for the meeting. 
uh, meeting was done in 15 minutes, we realized wow, I think we're on to something. Um, so uh, we took our methodology, applied it to other companies, refined it, and then in 2014 decided to really launch into full-on automation um, of this uh, process. Starting a, a consulting company in security in 2005 must have been interesting. I started my first consulting business in, in 2004. It was an interesting time. Tell us about that. Yeah, certainly security was still uh, not popular. We didn't have large, massive data breaches, right? Um, so, but companies still understood that it is really compliance and audit driven. They understood they needed controls in place. They needed to secure their applications, and uh, they need to have some policy. And they need to obviously the big thing was checking the box on compliance, whether it be HIPAA. Uh, at the time, HIPAA wasn't really that popular, but PCI was emerging, um, and we had uh, some FISMA work that our firm actually got into. And it's really grassroots. Uh, I started out as a uh, Chad Beckman and consulting uh, subcontractors. And it wasn't until 2011, January 2011, did I actually start converting. And, and I sat back and said, you know, this is great. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but what value am I creating long term? It was more of a lifestyle business. So began to convert those individuals to employees and really started to invest back into the brand. And, and that's where we are today. Uh, with Chad, regard to tell, the tell me about your marketing efforts, because it's, it, it's interesting at the time. Uh, I tried some different marketing things in, in some stock and, and some didn't. So from, you know, the 2005 to uh, 11, like what were some of the marketing things that you were doing at the time, if any? Very little. I, I dabbled in Google AdWords. I actually uh, converted a, one client. Yeah. And, and, and Google AdWords, I'm telling you right now, it's like the casino. It's addicting. Oh, I got a hit. All, All right. right, let's double down. Let's do some more. Let's do some more. Um, at the end of the day, it, you know, um, the only marketing that really works is word of mouth and networking um, mm -hmm. with regard to services, at least. Yes. That is the most powerful. So. You know, it, it's interesting. Someone gave me the advice that we had to give back to the community uh, and be part of the community and give something um, to, to be part of that and uh, make those networking connections. And I did that and I created a podcast and I ended up the opposite way. I ended up doing the podcast full time and leaving consulting. Um, so I think it's interesting that you, you've continued on the, the consulting path and it's been prosperous for you. So good, good for you. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, it's actually uh, was a lot harder to scale a services company. That was part of our uh, reason to, in 2014, it's really the end of 2013, uh, where, where myself and a couple members of my team uh, sat back and we said, you know what, let's look at the marketplace. We were doing some mobile uh, app security. We were doing some privacy consulting. We were doing security program assessments. And we quickly realized privacy was a roller coaster, up and down. People care, then, and then they didn't anymore. Um, then we go to mobile security. Uh, we saw a lot of opportunity for mobile security, but unfortunately, a lot of companies were not willing to pay more to really do it well. Um, and if they were managing mobile devices, doing a app, um, mobile app, review once a year, that was pretty much good enough. So that idea went to the parking lot. Uh, then we went to our program dashboard, as we called it internally, uh, which became our product. And that focused on our security program assessments. And that was the reason uh, why we really headed down that path, realizing that scaling a business on services was a very tough haul. And it was all about how good you could sell. So you almost had to be as good as having a, a sales and marketing function to keep you know, the, the billable hour is full and the scale the team as you did uh, actually performing the work. And so uh, that's where we decided to take somewhat of a pivot in the company and begin to automate some of our own intellectual property uh, and make that available to masses. So we could have some expert level advice and some really great reports that could become available to people without having to engage a third party per se to conduct the same assessment. Um, and you're also not stuck with a static, you know, report that you get from other consultancies. So we tried to um, stir up the uh, program assessment world a little bit. Um, now, do you find, did you find that the professional services and the products kind of now play off each other, right? And, and I think that's the model you're adopting. And when I think about it, there are other companies that do that really well and keep the two combined. And they really just like, they feed off of each other, right? So if someone will engage for services and realize you have a product, some of you engage with the product and realize you have services and they play off of each other. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. So we'll have, uh, we, you know, we serve very large companies and we serve a lot of small companies. <clears throat> and some of the small companies, they'll sign up for our virtual security team offering. Some organizations might call it a virtual CISO. And uh, part of that is we wrap in our, our trust map solution into that to help measure our performance to the right. company um, as well as help them internally communicate where they are and what has actually been improving over the each quarter, each month, each year. Uh, so that's been really effective. It, it's using that in that subscription-based model and as its own report card for our our services work. Uh, yeah, and we let's, see that. Let's focus on that more, Chad, because that's that's really. So was that an was that by design? Did somebody ask for that? Was that a sit around and go how? Because that, that's clever. For everybody, like that's an everybody wins. That's a here. You'll see how we're doing. You'll see how you're doing. We'll see how we're doing. Where did that, how did that get started? So it, it got started because we needed a way to get our product front and center, right? We're really good at talking about our skills and services um, and, and our productized offerings in that regard. But we wanted to be able to have a differentiator from the larger competition in the marketplace. And so what we did is we started to include our solution in terms inside of those uh, proposals to say, look, not only are we going to do what everybody else is going to propose to you, what they're going to do, we're going to show you how well we're actually improving your program. And you can log in at any time and take a look at those reports and get them ready for a presentation to the other uh, executive teams, uh, the board, what have you. And so that has become a, a major differentiator. Think of it as a security program management uh, uh, a sock, right, where you think about all the charts and the activity going on and the alerts. Well, that's essentially what we've done with uh, the program management level of security programs with uh, TrustMap. So when you did that initially, was it – so you said this was an option – was it like, uh, here you can give us this much, or you can give us this much, or was it more like, hey, we're building this thing, and you, you know, it's it's a little bit more money because they're getting value from it, but mm -hmm. it, it was a, a way to kind of get it both working. How did how did you handle that, and how was it received when you first started pushing it out there? So what we did is we would show them what we could provide for metrics, and uh, yeah. what we were able to do then is show the the customer. You may think you ha you want to start with policy or a vulnerability assessment or a pen test, uh, when in fact, based on a program assessment, baselining your program, which we would do for them to start with, we would shift some of the priorities because some of the priorities became more evident uh, where they had, they had to uh, focus on other areas instead. And so that actually began to enlighten the, the client to say, okay, now I get it. I, I see why we're more deficient in one area where we thought we were actually doing okay. Uh, one example, a customer um, last year came to us and uh, really liked the solution and needed a, a, an extension of his team our team to become their security arm. And he invested with another firm uh, thousands of dollars on their BCPDR when we did our program assessment. Uh, it was uh, yellow and red items in that category. And he was a little bit um, uh, confused as to why that would be the case. And so we began to uncover uh, some of the reasons why and, and help them shore that up in a short amount of time. And in some cases, it was communication. It was just connecting some dots. In other cases, it was actually some heavy lifting. Um, and so it begins to, you know, really draw out and, and, re and create a lot of transparency uh, across uh, the organization. So um, that's that, where then, Okay, and then, and then that plays back to what Paul was just saying, where if you've got that model of we have a product and that can feed our services and we have services and that can feed our product, it sounds like that's working pretty well for you because because when somebody says, whoa, Chad, I've got these findings, what do we do? You have the ability to say, okay, we understand them, you understand them. That's got to be great from a writing of a proposal perspective. And then you have a team that can go execute against it. That's right. It becomes what I tell others, and you know, we're looking for other consulting channel partners to use this to help grow their practice, actually, is – it becomes a recipe card uh, for services, and it helps to have a meaningful conversation about why they should start in one area versus where they believed they may have should have started in a different area. And so we can call out exactly why, and it's not us telling them. It's literally their people providing this data and us just giving the story around what has been collected and what their scores actually are. 
And so it grows the services and they can go as fast as they want to shore it up or they can go as slow as they want. And that's part of then adjusting the proposal for an ongoing management uh, for their security program. So it does feed into each other, definitely. And, and honestly, a lot of times what we see is the tip of the spear is our, our trust map platform because it's new. It's got neat reports that people like, right, the, the shiny object syndrome. Um, but it also helps to draw out a roadmap that has never been presented to a lot of companies before in this way. And that then follow on is the services to help shore up those those areas and understand what the budget is and the resource requirements might be to get it done. And that must have a trust factor too, right? So if you're the company that helped them figure it out, you're the people that gave them that, they liked it, it made sense to them, well then naturally you're the person that can help them, right? Do you find it works that way or do you find that some of the companies <laughs> say, hey, thanks, but we want to maintain some independence here, so we're going to go with somebody else. And is that okay? Uh, that's okay if they want to maintain the independence. Absolutely, you know. Our, like I said, part of our pivot in this business was to um, grow the software subscription side and continue to maintain our services. Uh, but but realizing that talent, everybody's struggling for cybersecurity talent, right? And having experienced talent, which we do on our team, becomes even more difficult. You know, 10 plus years experience certified industry experience can be very challenging to uh, hire, but not only hire, but to retain. Every company is struggling with it. So our service is going to continue to remain flat or slightly increase over time, but we see a, a, a fairly large uh, upswing in the subscriber base of our platform for the reasons uh, that we've talked about, right? The transparency, the communication, and then other consultancies can use it to help grow their own practices. And, and we're starting to have some of those conversations now. All right, well, let's talk about traction. That's one of the things we talk about on the program a lot. And obviously, being able to in, incorporate that into existing agreements uh, helps and, and then offer it as an option for new agreements. Do you find people, though, uh, you know, one of the things Paul and I have tried to explore a lot is, uh, so you're a SaaS-based solution. That suggests it's cloud-based. Does anybody look at that and say, whoa, Chad, I am not putting our risk information in the cloud. Like, have you had to cross that hurdle, or are you finding that to be more of a non-issue? Oh, no, we're having to cross the hurdle, and the larger the company is, uh, the bigger the hurdle. And so what we've come to realize is we needed to provide an on-premise solution as well as a, a, um, a cloud solution, our SaaS solution, which is the standard. And then we have a hybrid approach, right, like a private cloud. It's uh, where a company may have their own instance, and that instance is secured. It's only accessible by the client uh, and our support team. And so you know, there's really about three different. I've never said this before, but would you call that like the Bob Ross model, like its own <laughs> private little happy cloud? That, that's what I would do from a marketing perspective. That's probably the reason I'm not in marketing, but uh, I thought I'd share that with you. Especially yeah, that's today. a. That's very creative, and I, I don't know if I call it the Bob Ross model, but uh, you know, uh, I like the, the term maybe the, the Caribbean Island model. How about that? That was that was nice. I like that. All right, so, Chad, then, hold, so I just want to go back to that for a moment, uh, Chad. What are the some of the reasons that your clients give for not wanting to use the the public cloud? So I, recently what we learned, which is really interesting, is some clients, some companies are actually not ready to put anything in the cloud to go SaaS for any service, but they want to get there. And what they need to do is they need to actually start developing their own governance and their own policies and controls and understanding what it's going to take to govern data that's going to go to a SaaS-based solution. And so a lot of very large companies, in fact, are, are a little bit behind because they have a, a much bigger ship to turn to get there. Um, and so it's just a matter of time before more companies are going to go in that model, yeah, but until that, they get there. That makes so much more sense to me than what some people will say is they just don't trust the cloud. But what I hear you saying is they want to trust the cloud, but they want to make sure that they can provide security controls and auditability and do what they would do for on-premise uh, as much as they can in the cloud, which makes way more sense to me. 
you nailed it. Um, and, and this is generally coming from the Fortune 500 client base uh, mm -hmm. where we're getting a lot of pressure to go on-premise because they are not quite ready yet to go full-on SaaS with uh, uh, you know many different solutions, quite honestly. Yeah. And they have the rogue IT going on, and they're reeling that back in and trying to get some structure and governance around cloud services. So, well, And I think that's a, it's a skills gap, too, is what we were exploring on other shows this week on our network was that there's a huge skills gap uh, with understanding cloud in general, right? Whether it's a virtual environment or whether it's software as a service. Uh, but how do, I, how do I grasp that and how do I apply security controls? There's a huge skills gap there that uh, everyone is agreeing with me that there is. Uh, and, you know, we're tr kind of taking it upon ourselves in the security community and the IT community as well uh, to improve those those skills. Uh, even hosts on our own shows, when we get into conversations about containers and then we use things like terms like Kubernetes and everyone's like head wants to explode, we recognize that there's a, a skills gap there. But it's nice to hear that uh, there is a large section of enterprises that are saying, yes, we, we want to get there, but we want to make sure we're, we're ready to go there and have the appropriate controls in place. That's awesome. Yep. That's exactly right. Risk-based approach. Um, and, and that's what they're trying to get their hands around. What does it mean in the contracting process for companies that want to do a SaaS solution for a particularly large enterprise? The contracting process is even more rigorous. You have another third party you need to bring in, whoever's hosting your application, whether it be Google Cloud, AWS, who name a vendor and a major provider. They are going to have to be part of your due diligence process. Uh, yeah. And um, so Dave Shackelford was telling me, uh, and I don't know if you use this, Chad, but it's a kind of a, a word to all of the startups out there that are offering solutions in the cloud or anyone offering services in the cloud. The Cloud Security Alliance has a checklist for people that they can go, I believe, download for free and then use that to help vet vendors and have the right questions to ask and understand how to change some of their uh, processes to be able to make that move in the cloud, but ask all of the right questions or at least most of them. <clears throat> That's exactly right. And the cloud uh, security matrix, they map to so many different regulations and standards mm -hmm. that it, it's really a nice tool set. And, and you know why we have the skills gap, by the way, I want to mention? Well, this is a brand new territory. Mm. We haven't really charted down this road before, right? Just in the last two years, cloud has become really popular for delivery of applications. So I guess to me, it's not really that surprising that we have a, a, a bit of sl slow adoption uh, from the larger enterprises. Well, and I think when, uh, you know, a position of having a software company and, and you as well, Chad, we're working more on the developer side and service offering side. So we're embracing cloud because it has a lot of advantages right. to us. But on the IT side, it, that's, it's not yet the, that kind of a driver, right? They're, they don't have the luxury of saying, hey, we're going to offer a service. Let's just go start offering that in the cloud. And now we're going to learn all about it. The IT departments are very busy today, very overworked. They're responding to incidents. They're doing all this other stuff, you know, taking a time out to go say, hey, how would I go do this in the cloud isn't priority one. But for people like us that had um, from the software side, we're like, no, this is priority one. We have to go learn this stuff. And it's more of a developer mindset now, and that has to trickle down into IT. You got it. That's exactly right. Yep. And it'll be great for us once we start to make that transition as an industry, <laughs> because it's, the cloud is where it's at. It, time to market is so much easier, and deploying and, and providing updates uh, as a as a solution provider with a s cloud uh, offering. I got to tell you, managing a cloud instance is so much better than managing multiple on-premise instances of that application. Uh, that becomes much yes. more overwhelming to do so, and so uh, the cost of delivery and cost of ownership goes down significantly with the cloud uh, deployment. Michael, sorry, that, were you in another line of questioning before I interjected there? We no, were way off on a tangent. No. Okay. <laughs> Did you have more questions for Chad? No, and that, that fits so much of the, the arc that we've been exploring over the course of the year. And I know a lot of this matches the, the questions that you've had and stuff. And so, no, I, this, this was great. I was glad you hopped in with that. I, I think it's good. You know, I, I don't want to be the person who disagrees. I, I'm not sure it's a skills gap as much as an experience gap. Um, but you know what? That, that'll be a good conversation for next year. Um, Absolutely. Chad, now that you've done this, so so you went, you started a company, 
Then you figured out you could formalize the company. Then you formalize the company, and then you said, you know what, we really need to do a product. And now you're kind of doing both of those. Somebody listening right now, they're, they're wrapping up the year. Maybe they had a great year. Maybe they're wondering what's in the future for them. What would you tell somebody thinking they got an idea right now? And what should they do? What should they think about? All right. So think about who your market is, who you're really going to sell to. And you may say, oh, you know, I want to sell to the security leadership or I want to sell to the people in charge of application security. That's a start. Uh, but that still is not defining your market. So I want to emphasize to really define your market uh, very clearly. Uh, the company size, the industry, there's a specific person in a company size who's actually going to be purchasing it. In addition to that, what are you bringing to the market that's going to be really unique? What are you going to bring that is not already there today? Um, or maybe you have a completely new spin on what is available today, but it has to be significant enough. I would say ask your friends, ask your customers, uh, peers, whomever, mentors, to uh, validate your uh, opinion on how different your idea really is. And there might just be one or two things that need to change to make it really unique. And so I really value having a third party perspective, multiple third party perspectives to, uh, you know, continually refine uh, those concepts and ideas. And then obviously the market's going to determine how fast they want to adopt what it is you're bringing to the market. I like it. Uh, what would you? What do you see? What's an area that you think is underserved right now? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, quite honestly, I think we've done a really good job with endpoints. That's been around for a long time. Um, where I think is uh, really underserved is the. Um, this threat detection area. We constantly see about every year, in two years, we see a new. Uh, mechanism, if you will, a new approach, a new methodology to manage external threats to our networks, identifying those threats, um, and then preventing those uh, threats from becoming major incidents or data breaches. I think that's a space that's going to continue with AI uh, to evolve. Uh, more automation, more threat intelligence built into maybe massive libraries, right? Kind of a uh, an old, uh, a new spin on an old idea, antivirus databases, signature-based. There's going to be different ways to detect those based on behavioral patterns of network traffic and, and even users. Uh, I think that's an area that's uh, very ripe for development and innovation. Um, in addition, I think we have a lot more room to grow to integrate the security program across the business. There are still, I've got this, I, I'm going to give you guys just a sneak peek on something I drew on a whiteboard. We're going to put it together in a white paper coming up in the Q1. Um, if you consider the Gartner hype cycle and uh, know, if you can imagine that in your mind, that line, um, the left-hand side that's a straight, almost a straight up line. Um, that is essentially the, the point in time of maturity of zero through about one and a half for a company, right, on a maturity scale of one to five. And a lot of times when we see that happening, when they're really getting going with security, they're reporting to the CIO. Well, about at the peak of that first line where it starts coming down again, uh, what we see is then the shift of the reporting going to the CFO or the CRO, depending on um, the company's organization. Uh, not it, only in addition to that, it happens usually after they pass the maturity level too. So we're going to talk about this entire concept and how reporting structure and focus begins to shift in an organization as the security program begins to mature over time and what that means down the road. I like that. I look forward to when that comes out. All right, so let me ask you another question. We started talking about this before we recorded. So I, I, I want you to set it up, and then I, I'm curious what you think. I'm curious what Paul thinks. Somebody starting a business today, and whether they're going to try to bootstrap it, they're going to try to run a consulting business and build it out the way that you have, or they're going to separate them the way that Paul's looked at it, or I don't even know how to describe what I do anymore. So to take funding, not to take funding. Is that the way to go? Not the way to go. Look for seed rounds, bootstrap. What, what, what's your thought process on that right now? And, and what should somebody watching us, maybe thinking about a business, contemplate relative to that? And then, Paul, I'm curious what you think on that, too. Yeah, so one of my questions has been, it's been haunting me for a while, is we have the software, and I, I read about it all the time. 
uh, software startups getting uh, rounds of funding is, is that the way we have to grow uh, as a software company? Uh, we've bootstrapped to this point. We've gotten some great clients signed up, and uh, 2017 looks pretty good from a pipeline perspective with our software. The question, I think, is uh, how much is it going to cost to develop the application, make, create some market awareness? Is it a brand new idea in the marketplace, or is it a, a, a modified spin on a current idea that people already understand? And so some of those uh, criteria need to be weighed and, and measured and determined. Uh, the second piece of this is are you willing to give up equity right away? Uh, how much of the company are willing to give up in order to uh, get funding? In addition, I, you know, I've talked to a few bankers, too. One idea that um, maybe is going to become less less relevant as interest rates go up and people start making more on their investments. But uh, I think still there's a window of opportunity to get funding from angel investors as a loan and write some kind of guarantee or warranty around a return rate that you're willing to give over maybe a period of five years on that investment. I feel like you've watched Shark Tank. I was going to say Kevin from Shark Tank is all over that. <laughs> he gets that. He gets that. And, he gets, and, sometimes, and sometimes people do that. And and that and I I and I I like that uh, strategy, and I, I think it depends on the market that you're trying to play in, how competitive that market is, how quickly you want to go to market, um, and it also depends on your position as a founder. If you have a network where and maybe some funding from another business or. Uh, like in, in your case, Chad, right? I'm sure you went through this too. You realize that you may have to pull some people off of consulting, which is kind of part of your investment to get that software written. And then, then you start selling it. So there, you do kind of take a dip. Um, I see that in my, my podcasting business too, right? When we start a new podcast, it's, it's at zero, right? We have zero downloads, zero sponsors. And so there's a cost to, to starting that up. But if you can recoup that quickly because you have a network and, uh, um, and, and know the marketplace, uh, then that's good, and it may take a little longer. I think where you see a lot of the investments in, in Angel uh, in taking equity is you want to get to market fast, and you need a big chunk for research and development. And I think that's really the kind of the, some of the bigger differentiators there. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point, actually. Um, in fact, I think, Paul, you just helped answer my question. I think we're on a good path as people are starting to talk about maturity, measuring better metrics, telling a better business story around security. Uh, so I think we have a good captive audience. We, our software is developed. We funded it through consulting services. And so um, uh, we're, we're not necessarily the classical startup because we sort of have a funding stream that's coming in to help support it and grow it. Uh, but certainly, if you're starting from scratch, scratch and the product isn't developed it's a piece of paper or a mm -hmm. whiteboard drawing um, that's where I think getting funding and, and just going big go big or go home right. is uh, really the way to go yeah yeah, yeah and I think just... early on you don't need a ton of marketing and that's really what what we're finding too right I mean at a certain stage I, I think you absolutely do in the early stages your selling and marketing to your network to get going, yep. getting your customer yep. number one, two, and three, you are going to reach a certain point where you should then start doing marketing. And, and where you go is going to depend on what your product is and who your target market is. Uh, and that also determines how much you're going to spend, right? Um, there are some grassroots ways to do that. I think it does reach a certain point where, yeah, you're going to want marketing. And what type of marketing you do uh, is very important. And I work with a lot of organizations and we do marketing with them, right? And the question I always, uh, you know, the kind of some of the tipping points for me are, so like, where are you with lead generation, right? I mean, that's a really good qualifying question. Like, do you have the capacity to take in leads and convert leads and track leads? If you do, then you fall in the category of one type of marketing. If you don't, you should still do marketing for, for brand awareness, and that's important, but that should be less expensive, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the thing, one of the pieces of advice I'll give is, you know, in the security world, uh, information security, cybersecurity, everybody is targeting the same person, and there are a limited number of those people in uh, the United States. And they're okay, overwhelmed. So, they are overwhelmed. Yes. They absolutely are overwhelmed, and so. 
I'm going to go out on a limb here and say it. Cold calling is dead, yep. right? It's going to be very difficult. You may get their assistant, but uh, the best way that we've found to market is to create some really great content that has meaning and is, is helping people think more clearly through the problems and challenges they're facing. Under, we, we've took a lot of time to understand what those challenges were uh, before we started our marketing effort. And then we created some digital uh, campaigns and put our content out there to create a almost self-qualifying dragnet. So people that were really interested were going to raise their hand and say, yes, I'll download that and I'm interested in it. Not, I'm not going to buy right now, but I'm definitely interested in it. And, and then it's a market, it's a sales job to continue to keep those active and understand what their timing is. Yeah. And you know what's great about that? Sales is not a dirty word. And, and we, we've got to disabuse people of that notion. To your point, you know, I, I, I've been paying attention more to some of the folks that I now regard as sales leaders, and uh, and they've made it clear cold calling is the opposite of dead. But I think that in our industry, the way that it's happened is is it's not calling somebody incessantly and being a real pain in the ass is not cold calling. That's just being a pain in the ass, and there's there's a big difference to it. But I want to point out something else because I, Chad, I think you guys do this, or at least you have the capacity to do it. I think the companies that are solving security problems in places other than the security team uh, are doing a good job. And I think the trick is as long as you've got the credibility that when the other group says, hey, uh, we're going to loop the CISO into it or we're going to go to our security team and they go, hey, this is good stuff and you guys can run with it. That's great, right? And this is a thing we're going to keep talking about as we go. But security can't hold on to everything. And so as we can get security spread out across the organization, knowing that people are asking questions and including us in that diligence, I think is really important. And I think that that factors into the sales. Now, I was going to say, too, uh, we've got a story coming up later about the boom and, and investment and things to think about. And, uh, and that's going to shadow a story that I'm going to run in January in CSO, uh, thinking about that with third parties and third party risks, some stuff there. Um, but, you know, Paul, um, we, we put up companies every week. And uh, just last week, Chad, we put up, or two weeks ago, we put up a company, took in a $45 million round. It was from a minority stake in their companies, their first round ever. Uh, and it's because they had built up so strong, they didn't have to give up a lot of equity and they, they got a substantial amount of cash to help them grow in a much later stage. So I think you've shared a lot of really good insights uh, that people thinking about this are, are going to be able to process. And uh, I really appreciate that. Yeah, happy to do it. And, you know, I'm no expert. Trust me. This is, I feel like I'm still running my first ever company, but really what we have is two companies running simultaneously under one umbrella. And uh, always looking for ways to do things better and to scale and grow and be efficient at it. So, but appreciate the, the feedback. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chad, for your time today and wonderful insights. We appreciate them, as do our, our listeners and viewers. Michael, we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about some startup news. Chad, thank you very much for appearing Thanks on for Security me. Weekly. We'll be right back. <laughs> 